Yeah, I am uh, a disciplined South African. Let's pray for that. Molweni Chairperson, Molweni Chief Whip. Molweni Bandona Washa. Molo Gosiam. Molo 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 do we have Honorable Matiwane and uh, Malika? Vuvu, can you check for Yes, we do, Advocate. Okay, and uh, Honorable Professor? Honorable? Professor? Uh, she did log in earlier on. Let me just confirm. I am here. Oh, yes. Okay, Honorable Nagita. Uh, You're breaking up. Honorable Nagita. Uh, not yet, Uh, we have a minute to Okay. Uh, yeah, the house is in order. Chief Whip, we are... Chief Whip? Chief Whip? Is he advocate? He's on the phone. Okay. Uh, temperature, I think. Yes. Temperature, we may proceed. Thank you, advocate. Thank you very much, advocate. Good afternoon, honorable members, honorable special delegates, permanent delegates, and all the, the, the table and all the staff present. Welcome to the setting, the virtual setting of Thursday, 19 November. That is International Men's Day, apparently, and that is why we also have the Men's Parliament today. Let me start by bowing to the right first and to the left, as we traditionally do. And let us then observe a moment of silence for prayer or meditation. Thank you very much. Honorable delegates, before we proceed, I would like to remind you of the following. The virtual sitting constitutes the sitting of the National Council of Provinces. The place of the sitting is deemed to be Cape Town, where the seat of the National Council of Provinces is. Delegates in the virtual sitting enjoy the same powers and privileges that, that, that apply in the setting of the National Council of Provinces. The purposes of the, for purposes of the quorum, all delegates who are logged onto the virtual platform shall be considered present. Delegates must always switch on their videos. They should ensure that the microphones on their gadgets are muted and must remain muted. The interpretation facility is active and any, any delegate who wishes to speak must use the raise your hand function on the participants uh, gadget. Honorable delegates, I have been informed that there will be no notices of motion or motions without notice. And then we shall proceed to the order of the day, the debate on the provincial week, ensuring capable and financially sound municipalities. And we now call on the Honorable TSC China Dodovu to open the debate. <coughs> Honorable Dodovu, over to you. Thank you very much, Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP, the Minister of COPTA, Honorable Nkosazana Damini Zuma, and the Deputy Ministers who are present here this afternoon, leaders and representatives of different provincial governments, 
and municipalities, members of parliament. Just over a year ago, exactly on the 8th of November, 2019, our select committee of Copta Human Settlement, Water and Sanitation here in the NCOP convened a watershed meeting with five municipalities with the highest accumulated irregular expenditure during the 2018 financial year. According to the late Auditor General Kimi Mapuetu, who was buried in a solemn private ceremony and laid to rest at the Four Ways Memorial Park north of Johannesburg today, the expenditure of these municipalities was against their own budgets. They were breaking their own municipal policies and bylaws, and that they were awarding contracts which were not going through proper supply chain management processes. As we bid farewell and pay our last respects to this patriot, Kimi Makwetu, we surely know that through his actions, we had dedicated, he had dedicated his entire life exclusively to making public service and local government work better for our people. Indeed, Kimi Makwetu was propelled by a burning desire to ensure capable and financially sustainable municipalities. Through his principal approach to auditing, he showed us what it meant to be a public servant who serves, the, who serves with integrity, leads with courage, and acts with love of his heart for the citizens of our country. And, the, and in future, when the history books will be written, they will say that Kimi Makwetu was a great Auditor General of South Africa, a leader of unmatched skills, an auditor of formidable accomplishments, and a gentleman who executed the duties of his office with dignity and honor. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, at this hour, the key questions which we must ask ourselves about the concerns raised by the late Auditor General are as follows. Did we really listen when he was concerned about the deteriorating accountability for financial and performance management? What did we do when the audit outcomes of municipalities regressed? When municipalities submitted, their, submitted late their annual financial statements and when the unqualified opinion decreased and the disclaimer opinions increased? What is it that we can do as the NCOP members to sustain the legacy of Kimi Makwetu and to emulate his exemplary leadership? Honorable Deputy Chairperson, the above questions are of paramount importance given the crisis that local government is facing today. It is important therefore to answer these questions in order to make local government work better for our communities. I argue this point, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, because during our provincial week sessions that members of this house undertook at the end of October this year, it has been proven beyond reasonable doubt that all stakeholders, all spheres of government and all parliaments at all levels must work tirelessly to extricate local government system from the quagmire of embarrassment and shame, it is entrapped in. As we are engaging with the provincial governments, the identified and targeted municipalities and other stakeholders like the Auditor General, the National Treasury and the National Department of Cogta during the provincial week. As members of parliament, we made general observations about the state of municipalities, which include the following. There is a collapse of municipal finance with about 76% of municipalities needing serious attention, while a third of them are vulnerable 
with unauthorized, irregular, fruitless, and wasteful expenditure increasing. The inability of most municipalities to collect revenue while others adopt the unfunded budget. 34% of our municipalities have budget deficits, which means that their expenditures exceed their income. Some municipalities are cash strapped to an extent that they cannot pay creditors, that they owe escom and water boards while corruption is skyrocketing at an alarming rate. Contrary to the provisions of the Municipal Finance Management Act, some municipalities, especially in Limpopo, Northwest and Gauteng, made huge deposits at the, at, at the VBS Mutual Bank. The Section 139 interventions have also proven to be ineffective due, due to, to, to its proper, improper, incoherent, and inconsistent applications. The political and governance, as well as leadership problems, have caused service delivery to suffer most, leading to protests, instability, and the collapse of some of the municipalities. Some municipalities are incapable to properly implement infrastructure projects, leading to delays, incomplete projects, MIG diversions for other purposes. As such, Honorable Deputy Chair, infrastructure neglect and rundown, potholes, sewer spillages, water and electricity losses are the order of the day in some municipalities. Poor or no accountability and lack of consequence management have deteriorated the financial positions of many municipalities. And in this regard, many are failing to implement the audit outcomes to do investigations and to adopt the post audit action plans. And that oversight bodies like MPEX, section 32 committees and the disciplinary boards are not responding with the required urgency. And lately, the increasingly difficult environment for auditors where threats, intimidation and bullying of auditors is experienced. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, the situation at municipal level as painted above calls for urgent drastic measures to be implemented. We need to turn the tide to ameliorate this undesirable situation. In his seven year tenure as Auditor General, even before that, the late Kimi Mapwetu repeatedly raised the same issues about the state of municipalities with no concomitant actions from most municipalities to implement these findings. As members of the NCOP, we also observed in our respective provinces during the provincial week that the situation, this situation above, requires a massive intervention underpinned by a conviction to make local government a true beacon of effective service delivery, local economic development, and infrastructure development. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, premised on the above, drastic and radical interventions are required in our municipalities, constituting the paradigm shift from the past and the present to the future and in the way that we must do things differently. And in order for us to succeed in this respect, the following proposed measures are suggested. Taking tough decisions is required to salvage our municipalities and to ensure their sustainable recovery. Like during COVID-19 pandemic, when government took tough actions like imposing lockdown regulations, such an attitude is required to recover and to salvage our municipalities. Political parties across the board must only send councillors who are ready to give service to our people. 
those who are lazy, immoral, and stealing the public money must be fired now by their respective political parties. A dedicated and full-time unit consisting of all the law enforcement bodies must be created urgently to specifically focus on municipalities in order to uproot corruption, fraud, and all other acts of financial malfeasances. The Office of the Auditor General must be fully strengthened and capacitated in order to increasingly deal with the issues of material irregularities, which entail referring complex and intricate matters to the investigative bodies, issuing of binding remedial actions, and issuing of the certificate of debt against, against the accounting officers at municipal level who transgress. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, as I indicated, the time is now that we must rise to the majestic heights to fix local government. In the intervening period, we have learned that the touchstone of patriotism is the total devotion to the resolution of our problems that are facing local government until victory is certain for our people, until there is good governance at municipal level, until there is accountability at municipal level, until the municipalities are propelled forward to ensure that they address the triple challenges of poverty, unemployment, and inequality, until municipalities ensure that they safe and a healthy environment where our people live, and most importantly, until our people are brought into the mainstream of our economy and local governance by, by ensuring public participation of our people. We do all of this, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, because we know better now that the building of capable and financially sustainable municipalities amounts to building a secure future of hope for the people of South Africa and for posterity. On those particular words, we need to ensure that we go all out in the offensive for the implementations of the resolutions and the observations we made in our provincial week, which in my view, if they are implemented, they will go a long way in restoring confidence and credibility to our municipalities. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Chairperson. Thank you very much, Honorable Dodovo. We will now uh, call on Honorable Matiwane to continue with the debate, and we will give over to Mengwenya to continue presiding. Thank you very much. I hope I was audible. Honorable I hope I was audible. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Deputy Chairperson. Uh, of yes. Zopui, honorable members, yes. honorable minister and deputy ministers, honorable house chairperson, provincial whips, party whips, permanent delegates, special delegates, honorable members of the NSOP, honored guests, allow me to bring you warm and heartfelt greetings from the people of the Eastern Cape, the home of Istwala and Wei, Utata of Islamini who we repatriated and reburied in his birthplace on the 6th of November, who is among the striking icons that were celebrating their seminar this year. We pay tribute to them and recognize the sacrifices they have made fighting for total liberation of our people. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, once more, as the Eastern Cape Provincial Government, we wish to express our profound gratitude for participating in the NSOP Local Government Week which was held under the telling theme, ensuring capable and financial sound uh, municipalities. We further appreciate this opportunity to take part or to be part of this important debate that we hope 
we need to improve state of our municipalities in order to ensure that they fulfill their constitutional mandate. Local government, um, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, remains an important fee of government, which is closest to our people, whom this government belongs to and is established to serve. It is thus upon all of us to work together in ensuring that we address the objective and subjective challenges faced by this fee of government. So as to ensure that it effectively and efficiently carries out its work of serving the people and driving development where it is. As such, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, it is important that we repeat our sentiments that we conveyed during the NSOP Provincial Week, that this is a period that requires a change of how we do things and be of better service to our people. In this regard, we reaffirm our commitment to professionalize local government and public service for it to reflect the values and ethos enshrined in our constitution and noble goals of the National Development Plan. Honorable Deputy Chairs and members, at this 54th National Conference, the governing part of, of South Africa explained that, I quote, the main goal of state transformation is building a, de a developmental state that provides effective basic services with capabilities to take forward a far-reaching agenda of national economic development, whilst at the same time placing people in their, in their involvement at the center of this process. This honorable members is the guiding principle for our approach to management of the state, particularly this sphere of local government. However, the National Development Plan correctly identified one of the challenges in, in, in achieving a developmental state as caused mainly by weaker forms of, of coordination and collaboration within and across spheres of government and a non-responsive public service. It is for this reason that we are implementing now the district development model, which is premised on the principle of one district, one plan, one budget. Through this development approach, honorable members, we plan to address the identified challenges by the NDP of silo mentality within and amongst spheres of government, and as well as to improve the coordination of government programs in order to achieve a more responsive public service. It is through this disease development model that we have been able to get closer to the challenges faced by our 39 municipalities in the Eastern Cape province, including those that were a focus for the 2020 NCOP Provincial Week. Honorable Deputy Chair, we have a responsibility to support and strengthen the capacity of municipalities to manage their own affairs, exercise their powers and perform their functions as provided for in section 154 of the constitution. We are thus working tirelessly as a province through various interventions we are making to ensure that we fulfill this obligation. Honorable Chairperson, it is true, and the report is correct to identify revenue raising capacity and capability of many municipalities, of many local, local municipalities, particularly in poor towns and rural municipalities, which remains a challenge. This is compounded by our own challenges of government departments that at times own municipalities. To this effect, the provincial department of Kokta in the province in conjunction with the provincial treasurer, we have established a government debt forum whose primary responsibility is to facilitate agreements on payment of outstanding and area and area government debt owed to, to, to municipalities in the province. This forum, Chairperson, also encourages the municipalities and departments to engage directly with each other in order to resolve any outstanding issues that may be impeding payments in the intervening period. Chairperson, we agree with the report that the demand for local government services continue to increase despite poor economic activity and less revenue growth, which often leads to service delivery protests in our communities. The report further noted that and identified the problem of low investor confidence including investment in economic and social infrastructure for the deepened state of local government that we have today. It is for this reason, Chairperson, that we are continuing to roll out our small town revitalization program, which is aimed at providing much needed basic services and basic infrastructure in our small towns, and has led this to several businesses in starting to now to invest 
in some of our small towns. Honorable members, we also note that the report highlights the non-compliance with the Municipal Finance Management Act and other legislative conditions. That leads to loss and or withholding of equity and grants uh, and conditional grants such as the MIG. With respect, with, res with respect to non-compliance, and we continue to, to advise municipalities through provincial treasurers, and in line with the MFMA circulars, circular number 1893, M score circulars, and all other related legislation. In relation to the withdrawal of withholding of grants meant for service delivery, we reiterate the call we made at this NSOP that national treasurers should, should consider other alternative measures of addressing non compliance and expenditure of grants, as this has adverse effect on the people and not the individuals that are responsible for non compliance and low expenditure of such grants. Our firm view as the province is that our people, which this government exists for, should not be punished for sins they have not created, and that communities should not be deprived of mass media services and development of, as a result of. Uh, those individuals. It is for this reason, Honorable Deputy Chair and members of the NSOP, that consequence management should be at the center of the alternative that must be explored, as well as providing additional support where such is required. Honorable Deputy Chair, President and members, we are amongst the provinces that are affected by amalgamation of municipalities, which the report correctly, which the, which, which the report correctly states was not accompanied adequate financial and non-financial support. In this regard, we are calling for a review of how, of how municipalities were amalgamated to take into account challenges that are being experienced at present, including some municipalities in the Sarah Patman district in the Eastern Cape. We have noted the overall regression that has been reported in the Makala local municipality, and that things have not changed for the better in the Nelson Mandela municipality as well with respect to the audit outcomes. We continue to, to we continue to we commit to continue providing support in order to improve such outcomes. Honorable Deputy Chairperson and Members, we are addressing the government challenges that are, are affecting uh, the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Municipality, which the, which the report correctly identified as a major hindrance for growth of the region. Welcome and note all recommendations and commit to providing reports within the stipulated timeframes as the as the NSOP shall desire. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, much still needs to be done and we are committed to do more with the nuclear resources we have as a province. That continues to decline in our equitable share due to outward migration of our population to other provinces. We need to ensure that our improvement in the spending of the grant as a municipality is also upscaled. And we further commit to ensure that we we'll monitor this at all material times. We, further we must further intensify the fight against corruption reduce fiscal leakages through, amongst others, developing more efficient methods of delivering services and driving development in some of our municipalities. As I conclude, Honorable Deputy Chair, in the state of the provincial address, the Premier of Eastern Cape Honorable Oscar Mabuyane address stressed the following, I quote, we will not rest until we can all look at our province with pride because we would have built the Eastern Cape want a province that is enterprising and connected where all citizens reach their full potential. We are committed to achieving this goal, Honorable Deputy Chairperson and members. That is also expressed as well now in our provincial development plan. I thank you, Honorable Chairperson and members. You are muted, uh, Honorable House Chair. Yes, Mindy. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Members. Uh, 
uh, I've been requested to to step in, uh, given the the challenges that that we have. And let me express my gratitude to Honorable Matiwani for the uh, for the input from the province. Uh, the next speaker on the list will be Honorable Malika. Honorable Malika, over to you. Honorable Malika. Malibongwe. Chairperson of the MOP, Deputy Chairperson of the MTO, Chief Whip of the MTO, Deputy Minister, Special Delegate, and Honorable Members. Chair, the sixth administration in its medium term strategic framework priorities has elevated to the creation of an ethical and capable development state. This is a recognition of one of the key enablers of creating a better life for all. It is so because service delivery and the capability of the state to drive development is negatively impaired by the inability of government institutions to efficiently and effectively deliver the mandate. Local is not to the challenges facing public development. As of this artist in developing the state also enable the NTOP to focus on some of the fundamental aspects that need the focus of policy and administrative officials in local government. Diagnosis of the problem is not always the most defining aspect of but ability to have solution to key obstacles for, for good governance will improve delivery of services in developing and implement, implementing solutions. Our solutions should be short-term, medium-term, and to address the root causes of poor governance. Chair, the provincial week has afforded the National Council of an opportunity to recommend specific intervention and solutions to improve governance and address immediate challenges affecting local government. In the issue of political leadership, political and administrative is one of the aspects that contributes to the fancy and dysfunctionality of municipalities. Local government is a highly contested retained due its mandate of delivering basic services to their local communities. The political leadership in municipalities is more often than not a product of high contestation in words for, con for councillorship and political party contests for public representative in municipalities. Weaknesses of political instability have a negative impact on the morale of municipal officials and infuse fear that leads to negligence and fear to address mal, malpractice interferes with administration in human resources, procurement, and a limitation on addressing the challenge of political leadership is the fact that under government issue, issues like budget, project limitation, which can be measured. <clears throat> Political instability is therefore reliant on whistleblowing, uh, auditor general report, and reporting of incidences that undermine the political and administrative interface to prevent authorities. During the provincial week, members of parliament in differences and counter challenges, instability, and political interference which results in poor governance practices as municipality regulations and policies are not adhered to. Political parties have a pivotal role to play in, ensure, in ensuring elected representatives comply with the law and always place the interests of the residents ahead of any political conflict or interest. An improved political administrative interface can lead to significant improvement in local government. Political leadership can steer the municipalities to deliver their mandate. In the operational and administrative 
capacity and capability chairperson. Inequality and skill development in our country also manifest in the distribution of skills in rural small municipalities and urban areas. Retention of personnel from rural to urban areas has a significant impact on the capacity of small and rural municipalities. Also have a lower financial base on retained skilled professionals who have a capability to execute their functions in line with the exec expected competence of various roles. It can be professional engineers, chartered accountants, or experienced public servants. Small and rural municipalities struggle to attract and retain professionals. These factors contribute to the high vacancy rate of critical posts of accountability in municipalities. Vacancies in senior management, both like technical managers, chief financial officers pose a great risk of the capability of municipalities to deliver project and prudent financial management. Chair, the provincial week enabled the council of provinces to commit to the of comprehensive report on all issues raised by members of the NCOP to the chairperson of the NCOP. Without an, effect, without an effective governance, with all Municipalities will always have service delivery challenges. During the provincial week, we, we observed the experience and increase of 45% on consultants. This led the deteriorating capacity and capability on issue of provincial and national department through section 139 and section 154 in support and strengthen the capacity of municipalities to manage the and enhance the capability of municipalities. It's of great concern that most of the intervention have not yielded the expected outcome as demonstrated during the provincial the factors that contribute to the intervention of municipalities, a part of uh, is also due to structural limitations, which relates to the viability of municipalities to generate such expertise. And in one fifty-four interventions, monitored and evaluated to process of intervention in implementing the terms of, re of reference of such interventions. The identification of the root causes of the failures in municipalities which require interventions should be clearly ascertained to ensure interventions are, are commensurate to the challenges of municipalities. Some challenges due to non-viability of municipalities and intervention would not have the capacity to address such in order the national department of corporate governance provincial departments of cooperative develop a clear and standard approach to intervention as this will enable a scientific guide to intervention and to evaluate interventions. Reports requested from various to the provincial week should be continuously monitored to ensure the identified challenges are responded to. In a clear timeline, demonstrate the agencies of supporting local government by the National Council of Provinces. Chair, in the issue of service delivery protest, social agents of the rights of our communities have, have in expressing displeasure and exposing failures of municipalities in providing services to the community. At times, really challenges of communities are used by political actors at time for narrow political interest and resume business interest. Poor service delivery and the inability to de deliver on promises made by public representatives 
in manifestos and campaigns represent the breaking of the social contract with the communities and lead to service delivery protests. Monitoring and evaluation by the Department of Corporate Governance, SALCA, and Provincial Corporate Governance by the National Council of Provinces and National Assembly is important in identifying nine delivery of services and able proactive interventions. This will avoid intervention at a period when the state of governance is crippled, which results in non-delivery of services, prompting protests by communities which are impacted by the inefficiency of government, particularly of, on uh, of basic services like water, housing, sanitation, and as you, as you conclude, Honorable Maleta. Okay, should be strengthened with communities on implementation of municipal programs. In the, clo in the closure, Chairperson, the AM have a stop government. There will be implementation of recommendation that lead to the improvement of the local government as the critical sphere of government and provide services of our community or communities and a daily basis. The National Council of Provinces should play a critical role in ensuring and acute implement solutions which improve governance in local government areas and in main, small and rural municipalities. The, pro the provincial week has further displayed an agency required in addressing the structural challenges of municipalities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Malika. Uh, from the African National Congress, I will now take this opportunity to invite Honorable Fusser uh, from the Democratic Alliance to also take the podium. Over to you, Honorable Fusser. Can you unmute yourself? So am I audible, um, the PJ? Yes, am I audible? very, very so. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Chair, uh, Deputy Ministers, uh, the, uh, uh, Ministers, and all principles of the group. What we plant in the soil of contemplation, we shall reap in the harvest of our action. These words by the German theolog theologian uh, Meister Eckert could not have been more applicable on the current state of municipalities. Since the dawn of democracy 26 years ago, we are finally reaping the harvest of the ANC's government seed of action. It was planted in the soil of greed and dysfunction. Almost every municipality in this country is on its knees, failing in its legislative and administrative capacity, all due to nepotism, deployment, and an utter disregard for the laws of this land. Delivering services is not part of their terms of reference, but strategic, well orchestrated plans to loot municipalities are the business of the day. Slowly but surely, they emptied the vaults to an extent where prepaid electricity resulted in ESCOM debt escalating to billions of rands, shortages of water, collapsing sanitation services, and the non-existence of refuse removal became the norm of service delivery. The dilapidated state of municipalities allows only one conclusion. For 26 years, the National Departments of Corporate Governance and Traditional Affairs Treasury have abandoned their jobs and responsibilities because they allowed politics to blind the oversight role. This failure to ensure that municipalities adhere to the Municipal Finance Management Act and other regulations that promote good financial practices contributed to the current state of financial distress of most municipalities. 
What baffles all logical reasoning is the fact that the symptoms of financially diseased municipalities were plain to see. The media patiently see the visible decay and destructions of the infrastructure for decades. The financial mis mis mismanagement of councils and the consecutive poor audit outcomes of an anticipated collapse for all these years. Despite all evidence, provincial and national governments did not comply to their constitutional section 154 mandates of oversight. Instead, they erected an environment nurturing accountability inaccountability um, and without consequences and within this environment in, uh, allowed fraud and corrupt administrations to develop. Even the constitutional measures of section 139 1b were misused to settle political scores instead of governing towards respectfully upholding the constitution and the laws in compliance within their mandates. The proposed solution to place these municipalities under section 139.5 of the constitution, which requires the provincial governments to impose a recovery plan to secure the municipalities' ability to meet their obligations of service delivery to communities, but can also lead to dissolution, is nothing than a strategy to appease a certain faction of the ANP. The A is of the view if Several section 139.1b and c in some instances brought about further institutional regression instead of turning around the poor financial state of municipalities. A similar intervention under a different act will not suffice. The ANC created the chaos of mismanagement and accountability without consequences which, give, which gave all respective ministers, premiers, MECs, HODs, mayors, speakers, municipal managers and chief financial officers free reign. Without enforcing discipline, controls and action required to develop municipalities into financially sound entities. A total, a total, sorry, a total, I've got a little bit uh, of uh, interruptions in my, in my network. A total failure to serve communities is the inevitable result. What is the way forward then? All these municipalities are bankrupt, and cities, towns, townships, and villages are destroyed to a level of devastation. No basic essential services can be delivered. Their obligation to uphold the constitution does not exist. Rather than recycling the same methods that never produced improved governance in municipalities, root causes should be identified and addressed with the necessary discipline and unbending compliance to the MFMA. We have perfect legislation. In the chaos of collapse, NCOP's inherent role as a House of Parliament to protect the integrity of the three spheres of government and effective government now has to intensify their focus on the reasons of mismanagement and collapse by addressing the needs and challenges of the collapsing municipalities, finding solutions to reinstate accountability ensuring discipline and controls to ensure implementation of the government objectives. The NCOP, cannot just, first, sir. the NCOP cannot just cover ground in their oversights because as long as we sow the wind, we will continue to harvest whirlwinds of disaster. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Fosser. Uh, we will now uh, invite to the podium uh, MEC for Copter in Free State, Honorable S.T. Kangiza. Over to you, Honorable MEC. MEC from Free State. Do we have the MEC? Officer presiding, it appears to me MEC is not uh, connected. Thank you, thank you, uh, Secretary. We will now uh, move to the next speaker, uh, Honorable uh, Zandamera from the Economic Freedom Fighters. Over to you, Honorable Zandamera. No, thanks, Secretary. Uh, 
Honorable uh, House Chair, uh, to say that the state of uh, local government in South Africa is at is at a delay will be a complete uh, misrepresentation. Honorable House Chair, the reality is that we do not have local government. That sphere of government has completely collapsed. It is one sphere of government that was supposed to work because when our people talk about government, they are talking about local government. When our people need water, they want water from the municipalities. When our people want electricity, they want electricity from the municipalities. When our people want sanit uh, sanitation infrastructure, <coughs> sorry, they want sanitation infrastructure from their municipalities, not from the provincial government. Our people want roads, refuse collection in, on the side of the road and infra infrastructure maintenance uh, from their municipalities because municipalities are the coal face of the service deliver. And we will deal with the administration and its functionality issues later. First, uh, House Chair, let's deal with the failure of uh, uh, to create local government and municipalities that will be capable and financially sound. And the EFF has raised this issue before. At the center of South Africa, South Africa's local government, as it is envisaged in the constitution, it, it assumes that there are jobs, people work, and all part of, of the country has economic activity. In this way, House Chair, people will be able to pay for municipal services, property rates, water, and electricity. But the reality is that more than 10 million are unemployed. And those that are employed, majority, majority and below a living wage. As a result, municipalities cannot raise their own revenue. In its current design, House Chair, the Division of Revenue Act that is used to allocate money to the spheres of government and between municipalities based on these uh, false assumptions. It means that the, the, the equitable share and, and conditional grants that municipalities receive through the Division of Revenue is the main source of economic activities in these areas. Hence, we see infighting amongst councillors and municipal officials over tenders and positions. This is how the ruling party has been able to maintain apartheid spatial planning because even municipalities such as metros who are able to raise revenue priority, sorry, prioritize mostly affluent areas and white residents while our people in, in, in informal settlements and townships such as Langa, Umlazi, Alexandra, Marikana, Dipsluot, and many other areas continue to live in apartheid you have disappeared from the screen, Honorable Zandamna. Oh, thank you, thank okay. you. With Can each continue? Year, yes, with each year that passes, uh, House Chair, municipalities have descended deeper and deeper into the state of chaos. If we do not change the division of revenue bill, our municipalities will never be financially sound. Instead, we will continue to see hopeless disillusionment and frustration marked by service delivery protests, violent crimes, and corruption. Instead of solving problems of poverty, eliminate inequality, and reshape our society, our municipalities do not have capacity and everything is outsourced through tenders. They outsource even most basic things such as delivery of mail in offices. This happens everywhere in the municipalities, and we see it. Through tenders, prices are inflated, are, are inflated, monies are stolen, and most of the time projects are left incomplete because goods were, were not delivered. House Chair, we need to rethink municipalities, and in addition to amending division of revenue and equitable share, we must build municipality capacity. Municipalities must employ artisans, engineers, planners, qualified and competent administrators. What we see now, this municipality is a sign that even changing the law and building capacity may not be enough because the ruling party is finished. They don't know what to do anymore. Fifteen municipalities in the Northwest are under administration, and there is no sign of improvement, and administrators are also joining the queue of looting. 
in helping municipalities are awarded, are awarding tenders to state officials and family members uh, uh, and the relatives of the councillors. This is the Auditor General uh, Report House Chair of 2018-2019. In Pumalanga and North, uh, Northern Cape, there is so much instability caused, caused by political infighting amongst members of the ruling party that they have forgotten about our people and services. In the Western Cape, the only area that municipalities deliver services to is predominantly white areas because the Democratic Alliance is a racist party that wants to protect the privilege of few whites and continue the privilege of our party. In the Free State, since 2016, people of Mezimahulu do not know the meaning of functional municipality. The municipality was under administration. If not under administration, there were elections or some other challenges. People of Mezimahulu have suffered and it's enough uh, house chair. There are no ideas, no political will, and there is generally no imagination in the ruling party. Even the proposed model, the district model uh, development is misguided. That's political imagination and will be benefiting, will benefit consultants who are being hired by Copta while our people are not getting services. We must do away with consultants in municipalities. We must abolish tenders, in-source cleaners, security guards, gardeners, and all other workers currently outsourced. As, as you must, conclude, Honorable uh, Standamela. Our municipalities must procure majority of the goods that they use from local suppliers and should prioritize women and youth owned businesses. Mm -hmm. Our municipalities must do away with giving land to people to build malls and should build special economic zones and invite investors to create. But also our municipalities must, must be uh, drivers of job, job creation as the only dependent sphere of government that can change lives of our people. Mm -hmm. Lastly, uh, House Chair, we want to put it in, uh, in, in, in into record mm -hmm. that in our campaign to build capable municipalities, we don't want to deal with racism. Those municipalities that still treat our people like they are second class citizens, you must know the EFF is here. It is only the EFF that believe that the practical plan on jobs, land and capable municipality, it is only the EFF Honorable House Chair that will radically make municipalities an important sphere of local government. It is only EFF that understands what is to be done to build capable and financial sound municipalities, uh, to create jobs, eradicate poverty, and reduce the inequality. I thank you, uh, House Chair. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Honorable Sander Mela, for, for taking part in the debate. Uh, we'll uh, now revert back to the MEC of COPTA uh, from Free State, Honorable. Uh, Kangiza, uh, he's back online. Over to you, Honorable MEC. Honorable MEC, it looks like uh, we have a challenge. Let's then proceed to the next uh, speaker on the list uh, from the African National Congress, Honorable uh, Ambassador Dango. Uh, thank you very, thank you uh, very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, as the African National Congress, we will recognize the contribution made by the late Auditor General Kimi Makwetu in raising the alarm bells on the financial state of municipalities. In the quest of improving governance of our democratic dispensation, may his soul rest in peace and may his commitment in serving the nation with diligence endure in the public service. We also welcome the appointment of the first female Auditor General, Maluleka, and wish her well in taking the Auditor General's institution to higher heights. Successful reports of the Auditor General have raised various challenges that lead to negative audited outcomes due to weak and compromised internal controls. Prudent management of financial resources have a direct impact on the capacity of the municipalities to deliver all planned projects 
and general delivery services. Government has introduced various measures like the municipal support program, the project viability, project consolidate, local government turnaround strategy, and the current back to basics and team finance to assist municipalities with financial constraints and governance, challenges and the implementation of financial recovery plans. Despite the intervention, there are persisting weaknesses as reflected in the 2019-2020 audit report. Thus, our focus should be <clears throat> in the innovating and introducing interventions that will improve capabilities in municipalities in building financial viability through addressing the structural challenges affecting local government. There is an unequal playing field. The financial capacity. and compliance problems of the history of apartheid will be, must become fault find, uh, find solutions instead of fault, fault finders. And in conclusion, the system of local government and the assumption of the white paper on the funding model of local government require urgent intervention to ensure a more sustainable funding model, which takes into consideration the lack of substantial tax bases in rural and unviable municipalities. I thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, but having said so, I want to repeat that we should do so in the spirit of cooperative governments. There are no masters, there is no seniors, we are spheres of government, not tiers of government. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Dango, uh, for representing the, the Abusa Congress. Allow me, uh, honorable members, to, re to uh, take the reins back to uh, the House Chair, Honorable uh, Winning uh, I had to intervene in terms of uh, Rule 12 when there was a, a connectivity problem. Over to you, Honorable uh, Nguenya. Thank you very much, Honorable Mimang. Uh, the next speaker uh, is Honorable R. Pillay, KwaZulu Natal. MEC for Economic Development, Tourism, and Environment Affairs. Albo Benavi! Albo Benavi! 
Thank you, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to participate in a very important debate. And let me convey the good wishes of our, our Premier, Premier Sishla Zikalala. Let me also record appreciation for the recent NCOP week focused on various cases in municipalities. And we want to assure you that that level of oversight adds great value to the effort in, in, in overcoming the challenges that we all agree that we are faced. We are, of course, as KwaZulu-Natal, the province with the largest number of municipalities at 54, 54 municipalities. So those other municipalities uh, can appreciate the, the extent and range of our, of our, 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 our geographic space and the institutions that we, are, we have to deal with. And a large number of them are rural and totally grant dependent. And I'm already picking up on some of the themes that other honorable members have raised in their debates. But perhaps there are two key issues here that apart from the grants, uh, which are their sole financial source, uh, the ability to generate revenue on a sustainable basis is the one issue. But also I think, and many members have already raised that, the ability to spend efficiently, effectively, and with impact, I think, uh, that must also come more and more into the frame. What is the value and impact of even where we spend without any irregularity? Is it, is it having the impact on lives of people in a way that inspires and causes a multiplier effect? I think we want to concur with your report that you have uh, tabled and the, and the recommendations. And I think honorable chair, the report and the speakers who have spoken thus far make it clear that there's no single silver bullet. And there are a number of issues that have to be attended to simultaneously and over a sustained period to achieve the visible impact and change that we all wish to see. And I would respectfully submit that these issues include the following, and they by no means the, an exhaustive list. The Back to Basics program remains highly relevant. Uh, in essence, this relates to ensuring that there exist systems of basic services that work and they relate to, of course, the delivery of water, electricity, sanitation, waste management, safety, and local economic development. And I want to argue if there's any takeaway uh, from this particular input uh, is that local economic development must find equal space and priority in the work of, of local municipalities. Secondly, of course, the skills and the employment process and professionalizing the workforce, I, I think we must confess, and I think as the ruling party, we've confessed that with the mistakes that have been made and we have to reinstate a, an absolute professionalism in, in the workforce and management of municipalities. We also have to expect, accept responsibility for political coherence at, at many levels, uh, because when there isn't political coherence, then that ultimately finds reflection at, at, at the lower levels. It's, uh, we too in our, our province have a several coalition governments, and I think we must be able to mature our systems so that even where there are coalitions, uh, they are able to be managed effectively and not affect uh, service delivery issues. In fact, I want to argue that we've reached a stage as, as South Africans that there, there are issues which are beyond party political contestation. So when you have an issue such as a labor dispute that then results in the sabotage of the water systems that affects hundreds of thousands of people, then, then something is seriously wrong because even the same labor dispute or the labor of the workers uh, belong to families who benefit or not benefit from the water that flows through the pipes that they are going to, that they, that they have, been, have been sabotaged. And I think the social compact between labor, business, government and civil society must raise the bar on, on this kind of what I would call a, a value system that there are certain things we just don't do that it's, it's, uh, that we all agree it's beyond proper political, decent, dignified uh, conduct. Then, of course, there is the 
what we call the interface between the political and the administration. Uh, that comes back to the professionalism of the approach, but each one must know their roles. And that we are pleased that increasingly um, the, the, the law is becoming very clear. And I sense with all the enforcement that's taking place now, that there is beginning to be a culture change that officials who might be tempted to do wrong things in that interface relationship understand that when it comes later on, when emails are released or other wrongdoings exposed, there'll be nobody left there to, to back them up. They, the only thing that's there to defend them will be the law. And they must be able to show that they acted in, in, in terms, in, in terms of, of, of the law. I think, Chair, that we also need to revisit the old concept of the Masakane campaign. And I want to just link it, for example, to the illegal connections on uh, electricity and water. Yes, there is an issue of our poor people who cannot afford to pay, but that's why we have an indigency policy. That's why we have an allocation that funds that indigency policy. So illegal connections, there's no moral argument for illegal for illegal connections, and we must be able to take it up. I was very pleased recently in engaging Amakosi and his Induna, and then explained how that water system works in their area, and how it was designed for a particular level of delivery. And if you have the illegal connections, it then draws off the water and reduces the pressure and unable to reach beyond 50% of its destination. That they then began to understand that these illegal connections fundamentally sabotage the efficacy of, of, of the system. And then they're buying into a campaign to expose these illegal connections and ensure that the system, uh, system works correctly. Chair, we have our fair share of section 139 interventions. And I, I, I think, I don't agree fully that it hasn't worked. I think they have worked in stabilizing the, the municipalities and not letting the downward rush continue. Uh, they might not have risen fast enough uh, to the state where we, where we want them. Uh, but I think we see a steady, steady progress. There's two categories, I would argue. There are those smaller municipalities where the administrators go in, but then there tends to be a high turnover because not many of these administrators want to go out and work in the small rural towns. And that becomes a problem, so you don't have the sustainability of, of, of the effort. But we also have cases like Msunduzi, which is still under administration, but we see a systematic improvement. Uh, they, have a new they have a new municipal manager, they have now filled all their top senior management positions, and they're working their, their, their way down. They have a war room which um, systematically tackles the actual implementation and demands accountability from officials at, at every level on a systematic basis. I happen to be the, uh, we have a system of champions for each district in our municipality and I happen to be the but it's also linked to tackling poverty, inequality, um, uh, and, and, and unemployment. Of course, with the unemployment rate post-COVID is at a very high rate, and that then becomes a number one priority. I want to, the final point I want to make is that we've agreed that water is the number one issue for us in, 
in, in, in KwaZulu Natal. And it's a multifaceted issue. It's a demand supply issue. It's a infrastructure issue. It's an aging infrastructure issue. But the most important point I want to raise is the operation and maintenance and the enforcement of the 8% operational budget towards operations and maintenance. We have to look after the infrastructure we have before we can look at building new infrastructure because otherwise we are heading into a crisis. But I'm glad that the minister has raised this quite sharply. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, well. Order, honorable member. Uh, the next speaker is Honorable D. America, Western Cape. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Honorable House Chair, the Provincial Week was conducted through the hybrid model from the 27th to 29 October 2020, with a particular focus on Section 139.5 and the interplay between sections 139 and 154 of the constitution and its implementation in the Kanlan municipality. Now, Honorable Auche, Kanlan municipality is located in the western part of the Little Karoo and includes four towns, namely Ladysmith, Kalitsdorp, Van Weeksdorp, and Zuar. The local municipality has been faced with and currently still faces challenges in financial sustainability, which can be ascribed to political instability at the council level, owing to a lack of an outright winner after the municipal elections dating back to 2004. Basic service deliveries such as water and sanitation, roads, electricity infrastructure, as well as refuge collection has been severely impacted by these challenges. The systemic nature of these challenges necessitated the municipality to go under voluntary administration in terms of section 139.5 of the constitution. In this regard, the provincial department of local government appointed an implementation manager to monitor the implementation of a financial recovery plan and provided a holistic support package to the municipality. From 2004 to 2008, Kanlan municipality received over 33.9 million rand and the project consolidate from both the national and provincial departments to implement specific identified projects. Furthermore, the local municipality was nominated in 2010 to be part of the local government turnaround strategy program. Between 2011 and 2014, COPTA, the Department of Local Government, Provincial Treasury and Provincial Sector Departments reviewed the turnaround strategy with a view to bring it in line with the principles of the Back to Basics program. Since 2014, a number of critical projects were implemented to improve governance, enhance stability and service delivery in the municipality. Due to the internal politics of the council and the resulted dysfunctional administration under a previous ANC and ICOSA coalition governance, and it was during this period where mismanagement and fraud became endemic. Following the 2016 local government elections, political leadership at the council level changed, resulting in the informal coalition between the DA and the ANC. The new council inherited a municipality that was facing serious governance, financial and service delivery challenges with outstanding debts of over 75 million rand and creditors amounting to 69 million. A drastic imposture, conventional development approaches employed in Kanaland have not succeeded in lifting thousands of the rural inhabitants out of poverty. In order to address the scourge of poverty, the local economy needs to be diversified and the capacity of the municipality to deliver basic services needs to happen very urgently. And we as a provincial government are committed to support such um, development. 
the municipality stood, stood battles of the financial instability owing to the previous culture of financial mismanagement, hollowing of public funds with impunity and lack of audit control. Kana municipality was unable to meet its financial obligations and cannot pay all creditors while delivering basic services, resulting in a municipality inflating municipal rates in an attempt to raise revenue, leading to an increased number of payment defaults at the cost to its residents. Political instability and interference in the administration of the council that affects decision-making must be prevented to ensure the effective implementation of the financial recovery plan. Any instability at council level will negatively affect successful implementation of the plan, compromise service delivery, and divert assurance of finance, financial sustainability. Honorable House Chair, it must be stated that financial sustainability in our municipalities in the Western Cape remains a top priority. Uh, and it, in this instance, we as a provincial government um, place our municipality, as, consider our municipalities as a priority, and we will allow them in terms of delivering basic services to its residents and those who rely heavily on the services for economic development as a priority for this administration. While Kanlan currently is governed by an ANC COSA coalition, it must be noted that they have been in government during the time the municipality's financial sustainability was severely compromised and we hope that this time around, it will be different. The Auditor General's Consolidated Audit Outcomes Report revealed that audit outcomes across the Western Cape have improved, showing real increasing movement towards financial responsibility. The report also highlighted that all 27 DA-led Western Cape municipalities were awarded unqualified financial audits. Of the three remaining municipalities, all governed by the ANC, two received qualified findings and one is currently outstanding. The Western Cape government has taken every measure, Honorable House Chair, possible to ensure that financial stability and the backlog in service delivery as a result of COVID-19 is cleared. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, Provincial and local government programs were severely stretched due to funding constraints. The allocation in equitable share from national government has been decreasing year on year, despite growing demands for more services. The challenge to deliver services and houses to people is becoming increasingly hard. Our municipalities indicated that the levels of rates and tariff collection during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic have dropped significantly. Many recorded that payment rates are at a record low level. Jobs are under pressure and there is very little room left for our municipalities. We are currently in serious trouble under the house share and will have increased when the municipalities will increasingly struggle to improve the lives of their communities. There is simply not enough money to do the work and roll out the infrastructure needs. In conclusion, Honorable House Chair, while Cunland is not out of trouble yet, it is important to note that the DA ANC coalition have made great strides in overcoming these challenges. In fact, negating those before they are able to occur through transparency instead of corruption. It is hoped that the newly formed coalition in Kanlan between the ANC and ICOSA will build on the gains of the DA. I thank you, Honorable House Chair. Thanks very much, Honorable Member. And the next speaker is Honorable Ryder. Thank you very much, House Chair. What a joke. Mr. Masondo as chair and Mr. Dango as the provincial whip should be ashamed of themselves for the way that this program was carried out in the Gauteng province. 
The Provincial Week was themed as a follow-up to Local Government Week under the theme, Ensuring Capable and Financially Sound Local Government. The report that we're discussing today reflects that, and I quote, a key theme that emerged from the Local Government Week was the inadequacy of support to local government and the need to focus the 2020 Provincial Government Week on the Section 154 support needed by municipalities. So let us look at the support that we gave to the struggling municipalities and to their residents. On the Tuesday, the program was cut short to allow for questions to the president. On the Wednesday, the program was cut short to allow members to listen to the MTBPS budget speech from Finance Minister Mboweni. This is a National Assembly meeting, which we could have easily caught up on using recordings and the media. The Thursday program was diverted to go and investigate a matter which, while being most serious and dire, falls outside of the responsibility of the NCOP, and especially outside of the theme of the week. So let's discuss then what the NC were trying to avoid. The three municipalities under scrutiny were Chwane, Sedibeng, and Mfuleni. The Chwane power grab by MEC Maile was overturned by the court, and the Democratic Alliance government has returned to office. I'd like to say good luck to Mayor Randall Williams and his team. The Sedi Beng District Municipality was the subject of a substantial report released on 2 November. That's two days after our engagement. And yet, the MEC chose not to even mention it when he presented to us. The report proposes that the district be placed under administration, with councillors who supported certain decisions uh, being made personally liable for the repayment of the financial losses caused by their poor judgment and decisions. It's amazing that the arrogant MEC chose not to even mention the impending report. And the mayor spoke about everything except that which falls inside their powers and functions. Now let's look at Mfoleni, the basket case of Gauteng. The report on hand records the comment from the mayor that in spite of the paperwork, Mfoleni after two and a half years has had very little support from provincial or national government. The municipality then became the focus of the media on the 9th of November as service delivery collapsed in large areas as a result of both Eskom and Randwater shutting down supply one week after we were supposed to do our oversight there. MEC Maile said in March that he was finalizing a deal with Eskom. Clearly he failed, but he didn't bother telling us that in his report. The knock-on effects of Eskom and Randwater's actions have been extreme. As I stand here, the areas, there are areas that have been without electricity for 12 days. The suburb of Three Rivers has had no power for almost two weeks due to the total collapse of the municipality. The Phoenix Park as well is flooded with sewerage. Boy Patong is again without water. But you, Mr. Chairman, felt it more important to do the work of the Portfolio Committee on Transport than to focus on the NCOP's work where we should be making a difference. To show you just how disingenuous you are, Mr. Dangor went to great lengths to emphasize that only questions and answers were to be handled from Tuesday to Thursday, and that our conclusions and deliberations would take place on Friday. Imagine my consternation when I was queried on some of our conclusions while I was doing a radio interview on a different matter on the Thursday morning. It turns out that Mr. Dangor, rather undiplomatically, chose to release a media statement quoting some of his conclusions, but he packaged them as the conclusions of the delegation. When I challenged him on the issue, he could find no response and he hid behind the chair, chairperson. This really is the arrogance of the ANC on display. Total disdain for the people who elected you, total disdain for the job that we're supposed to do, total disdain for other members of this house, total disdain for protocol or even common courtesy. Total he's the display. chief and main games. And at the end, it is the people of Mfuleni, of Sidi Beng, and of Chwane who suffer. It's the people of Gauteng who must pay for Emisi Maile's court cases and appeals. And all are left with no real service delivery at all. This report is a whitewash. It includes nothing to show how the MEC arrogantly diverted us and did not disclose to the delegation what the real situation is. It includes nothing to show, show how the mayors of both Mfuleni and Sidi Beng contradicted the statements of the MEC at different times. It also does not reflect the fact that no amount of administrative intervention can help until such 
time as Latuli House intervenes and sorts out the political infighting in the Mfulani municipality and the city of industry. It may be a small problem in the light of what's going on, but even the process of adopting your report was flawed. How can the report be ATC before the delegation has even adopted it? Kateng sits with the chair, the house chair, and our whip. All of our ANC representatives are senior members of this house, and yet you can't even get a simple process right. Your arrogance is boundless. You should be ashamed. Political expedience, try to... Ashame yourself. You must be ashamed. It's why you lose your election. What I remember. Kateng was a failure, just like the ANC failed the people of Trane, and now the people of Mfaleni and Sidibeng too. Thank you, House Chair. Thanks, Honorable Member. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Honorable M M Paella. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, it is no secret that the state of municipalities in South Africa is in a shamble. Indeed, municipalities are facing great issues. Uh, it has become a norm that uh, municipalities receive qualified audit outcomes. In the last year's financial year, Madam Chair, only 20 out of 257 municipalities receive clean audits, meaning that only 8% of our municipalities are performing adequately and practicing good and clean governance. What is even more problematic is that fact that irregular expenditure in municipalities has increased by 7 billion in the last financial year, Madam. As it stands, irregular expenditure in municipalities amounts to 32 million. This is both alarming and wasteful in the efforts to develop our service capacity. Uh, Madam Chair, much work needs to be done to steer our municipalities onto more viable and sustainable trajectory so that they can perform at their level best. It is our duty, Madam Chair, to strengthen our forces and deliver relevant solutions that will ensure that our municipalities are capable and financial sound. The IFP condemns government leaders who deliberately disregard audit recommendation. The state pays exorbitant amount of money for the work of the Auditor General. And for government leaders to fail to implement those recommendations, it is a slap in the face. It is a waste of money and multiples of municipalities failure to improve their audits. What is more concerning, Madam Chair, is that recommendations do not require anything outside of what authorities are legally obligated to do, which means that though these municipalities are failing to do their jobs, it is disgraceful dis that public officials are failing to maintain even most basic accountability measures. Proper planning and budgeting, keeping proper records and reporting on finance and performance are all tasks that are stimulated in the Public Finance Management Act and government leaders are failing to do that in the first place. Uh, then uh, they fail to do it again when it's recommended by the Auditor General. It is widely unacceptable and needs to come to an end, Madam Chair. It, it is of the utmost importance to promote accountability mechanism that will curb administrative lapses, hold local uh, government accountability and prevent corruption and abuse of power. Local government can no longer disregard audit recommendation with impunity. Adequate consequences management must be implemented to ensure that local government faces punishment when they disregard, they disregard audit recommendation. I thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Honorable Mpayela. Uh, the next speaker is Honorable uh, MJ Mbisi Msibi, MJ Msibi Mpumalanga MEC for COPTA. Honorable M. James C. B. Mpumalanga MEC for Copta. Ukona. House Chair, uh, Honorable M. C. B. Is, uh, is in the house. Okay. Thanks, Advocate. He is in the house, Honorable uh, House Chair. 
Okay, Honorable Musibi, can you please take a platform? Honorable Musibi? Honorable Chair? Yes, sir. Am I audible enough? Yeah, Baba. Um, thank you very much for the thank you very much for the opportunity. Let me take this opportunity to greet you, the chairperson of the select committee, honorable Totovi, honorable members of the committee, honorable minister, the deputy ministers, my colleagues in the province and all officials. We want to take this opportunity thanks to appreciate the visit that was done to the NCOP in a few weeks ago. Um, which we took in three municipalities. I must indicate sure that uh, in the province, um, we have we've got a challenge in terms of good governance and financial management. Hence, you have realized those those Most of, our, most of our challenges is that uh, our minister, they overlook their own supply chain policy. And then that is the result to the fact that there is no Our chair, it looks like we, we, we can't hear the honorable member, I'm quite honest. Chief Whip, I can't hear myself. I'm trying even to put the speaker. It's the same. Uh, I would propose, House Chair, that we can pass honorable member. Maybe he will find a better position and you can grant him opportunity okay. to present later. All right. Uh, can somebody uh, communicate with him? Meanwhile, uh, I'm taking another speaker. Thanks, Chief Whip. Uh, honorable members, I would like you to call a uh, honorable Titoy. Thanks, Pap. Akbar Voorzitter, ten einde te verseker dat municipaliteite in staat is om dienste te lever en financieel standvastig is, moet die denkwijze van die meerderheid personen wat thans nie dienstegelde betaal nie, drasties aangepas word. En die populistische politieke ideologie moet veranderd worden naar realistische, implementeerbare werkelijkheid met die vervolging van die lafarts. Die probleem is dat daar gepraat wordt door wanbeskering en corruptie, en dat dit als die oorzaken van die verval uitgelegd wordt, maar steeds blij die ambtenarij waar die wandaren plegen in opposities. This session is yet another opportunity for government to ignore the inability to govern and to blame others for their misfortune, shortcomings, and failure to provide the basic needs of all South Africans. The saying goes that there is no such thing as true perspective, but only interpretation. The sad reality, Chair, is that there can be no interpretation to the state of local government because the stench is there for all to smell. Sis, the eight for quorum kaders wat dier die ANC op alle vlakke van die regering ontplooi is, Om die, om die syndikaat te versterk en te befonds, het tot die verrotting van die meeste municipale strukturen geleid. Die vrot loop letterlijk dier die straat en ons natuurlijke waterbronne in. Maribeng, Koster, JB Marx, Makwasi Hills, Mai King, Maklusana, om maar net een paar te noem. If you have seen one, you've seen them all. Selfs die minister van uh, Finansies, meneer Titum Bouweni, is bekommerd oor watersekerheid en die gevolge in dien daar het tekort aan is. J, section 153 of the Constitution stipulates that a municipality must structure and manage its administration, budgeting and planning processes to give priority to the basic needs of the community and to promote the social and economic development of the community. The ANC-led municipalities are not adhering to this instructive section of the Constitution, but there is no consequences. The only consequence is yet another self-pitying statement Entitlement enriched outburst and a blame shifting tirade to shift the focus to a, yet another turnaround plan, another strategy, another commission of inquiry. 
political responsibility and oversight clearly is lacking in most provinces. In the Free State, in the Northwest and other provinces, mayors appear to be unable and unwilling to attend to service delivery crises. Majibeng recently finally handed in the AG report after it failed to do so for years. This municipality is on the verge of a service delivery crisis with water leakages being the biggest concern. Residents are fed up with years of neglect by the municipality to maintain and develop infrastructure. Chair, the municipality last year could only spend 20% of the water infrastructure grants. Water losses amounts to 155 million rand. Simultaneously growing debt to Sebideng and ESCOM is of concern. Again, it appears that there's no meaningful plan to fix Majibeng. Even the Minister of Water and Sanitation made it clear that she has sleepless nights about the fact that the bankrupt city being will not be able to continue water to supply water to municipalities who simply cannot pay their debt. And then section 139 interventions, interventions are proven to be a waste of time and money. Administrations are handpicked by the ANC to intervene in ANC-led municipalities where handpicked municipal executives appointed hand-picked municipal workers to advance political agendas instead of focusing on the delivering of services. The ANC created the popular unbridled culture of non-payment for municipal accounts, and this resulted in Eskom threatening to disconnect electricity supply to defaulting municipalities, with the, inevitable, with the inevitable result of increased service delivery protests and further contraction of the economy. The current municipal structures failed because populism and self-enrichment were put before justice, values, and respect for the broader society. In closing, Chair, a quote by Charles McKay. You have no enemies, you say. Alas, my friend, the boast is poor. He who has mingled in the fray of duty that the brave endure must have made foes. If you have none, small is the work that you have done. You've hit no traitor on the hip. You've dashed no cup from perjured lip. You never turned the wrong to right. You've been a coward in the fight." Close quote. Chair, today it seems that cowards are plentiful and traitors too. Thank you. Thanks, Honorable Member. Honorable Members, now I'd like to hand over to Honorable Nyambi. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, House Chair. Greetings, colleagues. Uh, let me take this opportunity and invite uh, uh, the Northwest Chairperson of the Office of the Premier Finance, Cooperative Governance, Human Settlement, and Traditional Affairs, Honorable Motswana. Honorable Motswana? Honorable Motswana from Northwest. House Chair, Honorable Motswana seems to be in the house, but uh, his mic is muted. Honorable Motswana, yeah. unmute. The stage is yours. Okay, let me invite the Free State MEC of Finance, Honorable Brown, while it's Honorable Motswana is trying to sort uh, the muting part. MEC Brown. Thank you, House Chairperson, the Chairperson of the NCLP, Chairperson of the Select Committee, Sam Kokta, and members, the Chief Whip, Minister and Deputy Ministers present, members of the NCLP. Provincial Whips, MECs, Members of National Parliament, uh, Provincial Legislatures, or Protocol Observed. Honorable Chairperson, on behalf of the Premier of the Free State Province, Matisin Tombella, and the Executive, we'd like to thank you for affording the Free State Province this opportunity to contribute and recalibrate this prime level of government. Please allow me to cite a report written by the World Bank in 2018 on South Africa. It states, South Africa has come a long way since the advent of democracy, but its transition remains incomplete. 
I must remind the House of the first three clauses of the Freedom Charter, which sets the central objective of our democratic movement, and they are, the people shall govern, all national groups shall have equal rights, and the people shall share in the country's wealth. While the first two objectives have largely been achieved since democracy, historical disadvantages specifically to our masses still do not share the same in wealth of the country, creating a mainstay barrier for change. As such, the economic transition from a system of exclusion and segregation and apartheid remains incomplete. Honorable Chairperson, through the ANC-led government, poverty has declined significantly since 1994, but inequality remains extremely high. Improved access to basic services, such as electricity, water, and sanitation, the provision of over 4 million houses through state programs, and the expansion of the social way have considerably improved the living standards for millions of South Africans. A progressive fiscal system, expanded access to credit, Jobs in the private and public sectors and affirmative action policies have reduced inequality between black and white South Africans, although inequality within the black population has increased. Overall, inequality has risen since 1994, and in some cases, policies adopted by the government have inadvertently helped entrench it further. Honorable Chair, these challenges require a sustainable solution for effective and efficient municipalities and local governments. It is clear currently that the state of municipalities remain far from being ideal, but with a concerted effort from national, provincial and local government to turn them around, we also need to have one understanding and accountability at municipal level, which resides with its, with its council, and if they are able to perform, then provincial and national may step in. This will ensure that the lines of accountability is clear. And Honorable Chairperson, I'd like to outline some of the challenges that we've identified throughout some of the three state municipalities, but I'm also going to provide some solutions for the House today. Some of those challenges are unfair distribution of the national fiscus to local spheres of government. Significant regulations and cost thereof impact on service delivery and annual financial statements reporting. reporting. Challenges of political administrative interface. Unstable coalitions have a large impact on administration. High vacancy rates, extremely low levels of capital budget spending. Weak or non-existent revenue base resulting in financially unsustainable municipalities. Reversing apartheid spatial patterns and managing rapid urbanization has really contributed to a large part of our budgets towards reviewing municipality, municipality spatial divisions. Significant creditor payables, including bulk services, increasing debt owed to municipalities, and unresolved distribution and location of powers and functions. Honorable Chairperson, in conclusion, the province would like to recommend the following important ingredients to improve municipal sustainability. We have to review the fiscal distribution model based on municipal economy and service delivery. We have to simplify rules to improve reporting and focus on a greater part of the municipal budget to service delivery. We have to have fit for purpose structures, relook at bulk service debt, ESCOM based on the 1994 assets transfer from municipalities to ESCOM. National and provincial governments should support municipalities and do empirical research before introduction to new policies and programs. And then key technical positions need to be filled by competent individuals within municipalities. As the ruling party, Honorable Chair, the ANC will continue towards building a capable state for the improvement of the lives of the poorest of the poor. Thank you to the NCLP for visiting our province and for their extensive time spent in the province during that week. And we'd like to thank the NCLP for providing us with support and guidance towards the solutions and to the provincial legislature. I thank you. Thank you, MEC Brown. Thank yes. you. MEC. Thank you, MEC. Let me take a moment now and invite Salga, representative 
eh, Kanzela Shungwani. Kanzela Shungwani? Chain Northwest is also available when you're done. Okay, uh, I can start with uh, the chair of the portfolio committee, uh, Honorable Motswana. Honorable Motswana from Northwest. No, thanks, thanks, um, uh, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members. Um, the African National Congress Chair on the 50th, 54th National Conference affirmed the local government, that local government forms part of the ANC's overall social economic transformation agenda and that it is the sphere of government closest to the people. The service delivery agenda of local government therefore remain key to achieving a better life for all communities. The back to basic strategy that the ANC government developed rests on five key, key pillars. And those uh, key pillars are putting people first, good governance, sound financial management, delivering quality services and building sound institutional and administrative capable capabilities to ensure that every municipality performs basic functions without compromise. Though the strategy was designed with the objective to get all municipalities out of this, uh, a defensional state, support as well as incentivize them to stay effective uh, and with a targeted and brace response to corruption and fraud, the dire state of our municipalities demand a concrete and urgent turnaround plan to address the challenges that some of our early municipalities are facing. This daunting challenge must be squarely confronted and it requires efforts, a collective efforts to achieve the objective we have set ourselves to reboot local government uh, sphere. In doing so, all spheres of government should work in a collaborative manner to support municipalities that are in financial distress. The recruitment of appropriately skilled professionals is the first and most crucial steps that we have to undertake towards sound financial management of our municipalities. We concur fully that the provincial government need to scale up monitoring and evaluation capacity ensure that early warning systems are in place and that implementations of solutions is a collaborative effort in partnership with municipalities. Honorable Chair, the one size fits all and the hammer approach that characterized provincial intervention has regrettably not contributed to the financial sustainability of some of the municipalities. Hence our support for the closure of the window of recycling of administrators. An effective turnaround strategy geared at accelerating service delivery can only be implemented by vetted, ethical, and competent administrators. The renowned theoretical physicist Albert Einstein reminded us that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. Local government cannot continue following the same process applying the same failed formulas and expected different result. In order to advance ahead purpose, purposefully and effectively execute its development and sound financial management, accountability, and new ways of doing things. The establishment of forensic audit unit by the provincial treasury to investigate fruitful, fruitless, wasteful, and uh, unauthorized expenditure and all corruption related matters uh, is uploaded. Speedy referral of cases of financial mismanagement, fraud and corruption for investigation as part of consequence management will go a long way in restoring the confidence of our communities in public institution. There must be serious consequence for service delivery failures as well as the audit outcome regression if the downward spiral trend is to be nipped in the bud. It cannot be business as usual. The inability to investigate and hold accountable those responsible for failures to uphold the law in local government has seen some of our municipalities losing huge amounts of money to corruption. A cohort of patriotic public service cadres that shares values with the likes of the outgoing and late Auditor General Kimi Makweti that is committed to serve not their own interests but those of public they have committed to serve is required at the hem of local government. We must frankly concede that at the center of lack of performance in municipalities 
is acute lack of capacity. Example, municipality would have its own project management unit, but still hire consultant for design and maintenance of their infrastructure. We also recognize that some of communities have experienced regression and deterioration in basic services due to infrastructure failure, aging infrastructure, lack of investment and implementation of operation and maintenance, vandalism, theft and corruption, and culture of non-payment of services. Prioritizing implementation of the district development model as a mechanism for government to serve the people better through coordinating district-based plans and budget will certainly assist address some of these challenges. The active participation of all departments, including deployment of ministers, deputy ministers, and MECs as district champion in municipal integrated development plan, IDP planning processes will ensure that departmental plans and budget are part of the inform and informed by district IDPs. Besides the strengthening the governmental structures for better coordination of development efforts, it must ultimately lead to reinforcing of funding for maintenance of bulk infrastructure by COCTA and Treasury. Unless all of us embrace our civic duty and the spirit of Masakan and encourage those that are able to afford payments of rates in municipalities, local government will continue to be under pressure. In conclusion, Honorable Chair, as the African National Congress, we are committed to building a developmental state that provides effective basic services in partnership with our people. To this end, ethical and moral leadership is required to take forward the far-reaching agenda of national economic development, while at the same time, our place, uh, at the same time, at the same time, our placing people and their involvement at the center of the processes. Honorable Chair. Thank you, leader. The next speaker is a Salga representative, Councillor Shungwani. Councillor Shungwani. Um, <clears throat> thanks, uh, Chairperson, and the two chairpersons of the NCOP, honorable members. It is a, a distinct honor to address this NCOP debate on the provincial week under the theme, building a capable and the financial sound municipalities. Honorable Chairperson, allow me to start off by expressing sadness at the untimely passing of one of our own, the Order General, Kim Makwetu, who passed away unexpectedly. The end of this month will have marked the completions of his term of office that indeed contributed immensely towards building a capable and financial sound municipalities. It has been an honor and a privilege for Salga to have witnessed this energy and devotions to her professions that at the core of the public financial accountability in this beloved country. It will forever remain in our hearts and memories. Honorable Chairperson, in two weeks' time, on the 5th of December, we will celebrate 20 years of democratic local government. It is Salga's view that local government has undergone rapid transitions and transformations over the last 20 years. There can be no doubt that local government has had a profound impact on the lives of uh, many ordinary South Africans in expanding the provision of services to our people. While it is true that uh, a number of uh, serious and complex challenges persist in some municipalities, by and large, local government has delivered quality services and better life for the majority of our people. Official statistics show that uh, tremendous progress has been made particularly in historically neglected areas like former homelands, despite the reality that municipalities are continually chasing a moving target due to our population growth and in migrations rapidly giving a rise to new settlements. Local government finances has come under a lot of scrutiny over the past few months uh, which has been further exacerbated by the negative impact of the COVID-19 on the revenue collections of municipalities. To indeed breathe life and giving effect to the theme of this NCOP, the building of the capable and the financial sound municipalities, much needs to be done by government across all three spheres. Honorable chairpersons and members, as the starting point, it is our observations that there are serious weaknesses in our internal municipal oversight mechanisms. The Auditor General's 2018-2019 uh, uh, municipal audit outcome confirms that our local leaders, including mayors, 
and municipal councils and municipal public account committees provide very little oversight over what happens in the municipal administrations and what is uh, executed uh, by our political leaders in municipalities. It is our proposal that um, though the parliament is currently processing amendment to the Structures Act that intend to legislate the roles of MPEX, the political assurance provides providers must play a more active role in ensuring that the preventative controls are implemented. Secondly, chairpersons and members, building capable and financial sound municipalities also requires accountability and the consequence management. It is our observations that uh, one of the key findings of the other generals over the past years has been that of the cases of violations and transgressions in municipalities which are not being pursued, and those responsible are not sufficiently held accountable. Following our engagement with the Auditor Generals on the 18th of June 2020, on the municipal audit outcomes for the year 2018-2019, we approved an approach under the theme to extract consequences and accountability from municipalities. In this regard, we have already directed municipalities to finish us with their response plans to address the occurrence resulting in a negative audit result as well as uh, the provisions of the, the very same results of the skills assessment of the respective finance departments with the view to establish the necessary capacity to prevent this recurrence of the citations by the order general. And having secured detailed information from the AG, we are highly concerned about municipal employees and staff in the employee of the state doing business with municipalities as well as consultants that provided financial support to our municipalities with no resulted improvement or impact on the financial management of our institutions. It is disturbing that the AG information confirms that in 40 municipalities, tender awarded were made to municipal officials. In 77 municipalities, awards were made to close family members of employees or to councillors. In 151 municipalities, private awards were made to other state officials, and in 107 municipalities, false declarations were made by employees or councillors. It is further concerning that despite the use of uh, 393 service providers providing financial management and reporting support to municipalities at a, at a cost of 1.2 billion, we are not seeing the committed results. With the law enforcement agencies already scooping those implicated in these self-saving acts, of depriving the poorest of the poor, and in our quest to extract consequence of management and accountability. The Salga NEC has also directed that the further steps are taken to address this scourge. We have therefore directed all affected municipalities to provide the response plans to address the financial misconduct of their related municipal employees in line with the 2014 municipal regulations on financial misconduct procedures and criminal procedures. Lastly, Chairperson, the solutions for local government is to deal with municipal financial, financial health challenges. And again, the AG 2018-2019 municipal audit outcomes confirmed that the financial statements show increasing indicators of collapse in local government finances. The AG further confirms that the financial woes of local governments here also weighs heavily on municipal creditors. As it relates to debts owed to municipalities, it is well known that uh, an average of 59% of municipal debtors are not recoverable. In 55 municipalities, more than 80% cannot be recovered. And debt collections at 99 municipalities was more than 90 days. And in conclusion, uh, Chairperson, uh, because of your time, in, In light of the realities, we are once again tabling the following considerations. One, to put together measures to write off the ever-increasing household debt to municipalities, including the introductions of a, a national bill for the writing off of these household debts in exchange for the installations of prepaid water and electricity meters. Number two, to improve municipal revenue collections instruments through measures such as the amending the tax administrations act so that before such pays tax refund, they first check if the particular taxpayer does not have money due to his or a municipality. 
if the taxpayer owes the amount due to the municipality, will be paid first before refund is deposited to the taxpayer account. Uh, subsection following to that one, it will be the amendment schedule to section 10 of the Municipal Systems Act, so that it is not only municipal councillors and employees who pay, uh, and, and those will be in areas with their municipal bills for a period of more than three months. This requirement should be extended to all state employees and elected and appointed representatives in other spheres of government. C, and also to establish a district revenue collection agency. This will, bet, will make it better collection efficiencies and will free up municipal personnel to focus on more pressing service delivery efforts. Such systems and processes will be considered in putting this together after due diligence is done. And, uh, and also the amendment of the procurement regulations to make it compulsory for any potential service provider to produce a municipal services rate compliance certificate prior to being awarded a government contract. For to resolve constitutional issues relating to electricity. As you conclude, Councillor Shumwani. Thank you so much, Chairperson. As I conclude, as Salga recommend that government take these situations as a matter of agencies and act decisively. The findings of the National Treasurer in depth study to finances of owing municipalities is not just limited to the notion out of the public of corruptions, lack of leaderships and political will, but there is a number of municipalities which genuinely cannot come back from this situation due to economic situations. This needs a, a pragmatic solutions from all of us as government. I thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Councillor Shungwani. Thank you, thank you. I don't know whether Mpumalanga um, MEC for Kokta, it's on the line to conclude these six minutes as there was a problem of network. Uh, MEC MCB, are you still on the line? The network, is it fine? It seems if, as if it's still struggling in terms of network, then I'll now invite Honorable uh, Nana. Honorable Nana. Thank you very much. Uh... House Chairperson, Honorable Members. The thoughts behind the idea of a provincial week are excellent, and I have no doubt in my mind of the good intentions of those who conceived the idea. However, it will give us a dose of good to relook at the current model, because in my opinion, it is defeating the good intentions, and I am happy to make my contributions in an appropriate forum. Honorable members, on the 25th of June, 2019, I had, the, I had the privilege to speak in the State of the Nation Address debate. And on that day, I raised alarm at the deteriorating state of affairs in Nelson Mandela Bay. And of course, the governing party dismissed it as being alarmist because all was well in Nelson Mandela Bay and the DA was just mischievous. What we found during the provincial week, it turned out that in fact, all was not well in Nelson Mandela Bay. And this was confirmed by two honest and frank presentations by the Eastern Cape's MEC for Cocta, Honorable Nata, and a representative of National Treasury. The presentation by the MEC confirmed that we have confirmed what we have always been red flagging as the GA and I would like to commend him for his bravery and forthright diagnosis, knowing this could cost him his political career. Ladies and gentlemen, Nelson Mandela Bay is broken. There is an interim mayor in place since December 2019. It is a new position that is neither in our constitution nor the Municipal Structures Act. It is an invention you can only find in Nelson Mandela Bay. And by the way, I have seen correspondence in which these days, Councillor Buyaya addresses himself as the executive mayor. Since the illegal suspension and subsequent, and subsequent golden handshake paid up to, up to 2.1 million paid to the city manager, NMB holds a South African record of having had no less than five acting city managers in a space of, of only 12 months. These appointments ranged from a junior staff member to a tainted and an underqualified individual who was later arrested by the Hawks for corruption. This is a definite sign of instability. 
In 2016, 2017, and 2017, 2018 financial years, the DA-led government spent its allocated 100% USDG funding. And in appreciation of this, National Treasury further allocated a windfall of 170 and 200 million respectively. Thirdly, the same cannot be said about the coalition of corruption. My colleagues in NMB are telling me of underperformance of unimaginable proportions. In 2019-2020, the coalition of corruption could only spend 46% of its capital budget. This underspending has had a domino effect on the current financial year because the capital budget for 2020-2021 has decreased to 1.3 billion and prospects of them surpassing their previous financial performance are rather dim, to put it mildly, Chairperson. After spending two billion by the ANC administration with not a single bus on the road, the DA-led coalition in just 18 months in office in Nelson Mandela Bay got the IPTS bus system up and running and profitable. Again, sadly, the IPTS has collapsed and it is one of the reasons National Treasury is withholding all grant disbursements due to, due to non-compliance with National Treasury's requirements. Despite the misleading assertions by the Speaker of Council that Council and its committees were functional and met regularly, a most critical portfolio committee on Treasury last met on the 25th of February, 2020. NMB holds another South African record of longest council meetings with not a single item being passed. The speaker of NMB is a rogue and law unto herself. She has no regard or respect for the constitution of the Republic or the very council rules of order she is supposed to safeguard. She has done everything inhumanly possible to cling to the blue light and bodyguards by preventing opposition parties from, tab from tabling legally compliant motions to remove her and the, and the interim mayor from office. The speaker of this cash-strapped municipality through a court order obtained by the DA in August 2020, which directed her to convene a council meeting whose business would, amongst other things, elect a new mayor. She, on frivolous grounds, chose to appeal the court order, further misusing resources they do not have. Needless to mention, honorable members, her appeal was dismissed with costs. Now the stage is set for the election of the DA's provincial leader as the new executive mayor of Nelson Mandela Bay. And the, and the outgoing speaker can expect a legal, a legal bill from the office of the new executive mayor for her own account. Honorable members, how to steal a city part two is well underway in Nelson Mandela Bay. That municipality has been broken inch by inch, piece by piece by the coalition of corruption with little purposeful action from the governing party, the ANC. Just recently, a Geneva-based anti-crime NGO reported that known gangsters in the city have teamed up with corrupt politicians to access clean money through tenders. These thugs have gone as far as hijacking tenders, launder money, municipal officials and councillors live in fear for their lives, and these rogues will go as far as murdering those who stand on their way. Honorable members, in conclusion, allow me to pass my sincere and heartfelt condolences to the family of Councillor Bobani, who succumbed to COVID last week. He will be buried uh, in Port Elizabeth tomorrow. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you very much, Honorable House Chair. Thank you, Honorable Nana. The next speaker is Honorable Nsube. Honorable Nsube. No, no, thanks, uh, Honorable House Chair, Honorable Members. Uh, we are convening today coinciding with the International Men Day. And I think the International Board of Men have outlined the reasons why we, are, why we should celebrate the, the, the Men's Day. A part of them which constitutes 76% of suicides 
constitute 85% of homeless people are victims of 70% of homicides. Uh, but in the context and the lens of South Africa, in terms of the gender-based violence, I think it's upon us as a society to re-educate the boy child, to react logically and rationally in any situation that they may face favorably and unfavorably. Chair, with your permission, I think uh, we would be lying to ourselves as a liberation movement, the ANC, the governing party, to say that uh, we are content with the state of municipalities that uh, they are at currently. Indeed, uh, we are not uh, satisfied, we are not content as a liberation movement. But I think we must never use a blanket approach uh, when we come to municipalities that all of them are in the state of deterioration. However, I think the municipalities that are performing the best, among those that are not performing, facing challenges. And I think as a society, as a people, we must build upon uh, those uh, municipalities that are currently doing well. Uh, we must never uh, be deterred by opposition in South Africa. The primary existence of the opposition in South Africa has always been to oppose the policies of the ANC. And over the years, from 1994 till today, they have not given any substantial policies that can change our lives or the people's lives generally. So they can continue to say whatever they do, will continue to service our people. And I think with the recent uh, by-elections, our people have pledged uh, support and reaffirmed the ANC as a liberation movement, believing that it is the only the ANC that can take the aspirations of our people going forward. Thank you very much, House Chair. The ANC needs 1991 ready to govern guideline for the democratic South Africa, locates local government as a crucial player in building democracy as is closer to the people and have a higher level of local participation in planning process and decision making. Participation of residents in electing public representatives at the ward level increases the level of participation and accountability, fast enhancing our democracy. The local government is interested in delivering services contained in the Constitution Bill of Rights for the provision of basic services such as water, housing, and the creation of environment that does not harm the well-being of everyone. The basic services delivered by municipalities occur under various conditions that impact the capability and capacity of municipalities to deliver, to deliver on their mandate. There are various internal and external factors which have an impact on the municipality's planning process and decision making. This can be the local economy, crime, natural disaster, ecological factors, lack of skills in municipalities, special planning, demographical location, and many other factors. The provincial week signified the institutional design of parliament and the role of the SOP of oversight and to represent the views of local, provincial, and national government. The NSOP is the melting pot of intergovernmental cooperation and accountability. Service delivery and budget implementation plan planning and integrated development plans play systematic and scientific role in development of public resources in delivering various services to the people. One of the major challenges affecting local gov government is planning. This results in instability in inability of municipalities to deliver projects on time within allocated funds. Other municipalities have unfunded budgets. Municipal infrastructure grants and other grants provide, provided to the local government are insufficiently utilized due to the problem of the abilities that we find in our municipalities. The Department of Cooperative and Governance and Social Affairs has established a municipal infrastructure support agent to provide specific tailor-made intervention to support the implementation of infrastructure development projects that 
are municipalities with different limitations. The provision of basic services such as water, sanitation, housing, public amenities such as parks, labyrinths, fire, firefighters, roads, purification plants, amongst other fun functional provide critical services which improve well-being of all. The dignity of South Africans will be restored when local government effectively delivers its mandate. The district, the district development model will strengthen the intergovernmental relations of municipalities with public entities and the provincial and national departments. Planning through the district development model will enhance the one district on plan budget approach which will focus resources into priority areas for regional economic development as envisioned in the ready to govern from the regional government. The DGM strengthened the three tier government systems. Honorable House Chair, during the provincial week with the interface of the SOP, the province and the local government was at play members of the SOP addressing critical aspects of implementation of infrastructure projects. We should welcome the focus and commitment of members of the SOP during the provincial week as substantive and pivotal recommendations were made in all provinces focusing on municipalities. One of the disinjunctions identified during the oversight visit is poor planning and excess between integrated development plans and service delivery and budget implementation plan at Mangau Metropolitan municipality and many municipalities across the, the, the country. This is a matter of great concern as integrated development plans represent specific needs of communities as a result of participatory process of communities from different wards. This next source is worsened by situation of municipalities having unfunded budgets resulting in some of planned projects in service delivery and budget implementation plan to deliver, uh, which undermines service delivery and social development. In other circumstances, House Chair, Pokwani local municipality in Northern Cape experienced political instability, which delayed the review of integrated development plan. The local government model is based on planning which locates the voices of residents in the center of decision making of, program, of programs of municipalities. The separate development by apartheid has left a legacy of IDPs of municipalities should address such as spatial planning and direct development to all areas with no basic social infrastructure with, which is conducive for, all, for well-being of all. The capacity and capability to plan should be enhanced by the municipality Municipal Infrastructure Support Agent. As many of the municipalities visited have, as many of the municipalities that we have visited have challenges of infrastructure development despite the backlog in social infrastructure for many communities which require such infra infrastructure for realization of the constitutional right to dignity. The Municipal Infrastructure Support Agent is an important entity which will be further capacitated to support municipalities to fully utilize the municipal infrastructure grants allocate allocation which many municipalities rely on due to revenue constraints. The inability to spend and deliver the, the required project leads to municipalities losing allocation from municipal infrastructure grants. This delays much needed savings, particularly noting the high levels of unemployment, poverty and inequality in our rural areas and townships. Honorable House Chair, failures to adhere to MI, MIG compliance requ requirements pose a significant risk of municipalities getting approval for a grant. In many instances, municipal, municipalities which fail to spend allocated funds request rollovers which are at times rejected. This disabuses the poor unemployed, unemployed local economy holistically uh, disables the development. The implementation of South Africa integrated urban development framework to strengthen rural urban linkage, promote urban resilience, create safe and burn spaces, 
This cannot be realized without an ethical and capable local government which plays a leading role in social and economic development. Honorable House Chair, infrastructure maintenance is another key of area, is another key of area of concern as neglected for the development of, of few of new rather municipalities. Municipalities should prioritize maintenance of infrastructure to ensure that to ensure they endure for a long period. The national government has amended the municipal, municipal infrastructure grant framework to cater for emergency projects allocating 10% for repairs and refurbishment of water infrastructure and 10% of sanitation and PPE provision during the pandemic, which has provided much needed relief in the response to pandemic. One of the challenges which require our attention is the increased infrastructure vandalism in our municipalities. At times, this vandalism is due to non-maintenance or non-use infrastructure resulting in the facilities being damaged. Lack of water infrastructure maintenance also compromises water safety, which is also a threat to the health of our communities. We should continuously have a dialogue with our people as a political parties, public representatives, and civil society to encourage communal protection of public infrastructure belong to the representative of the people. Vandalism delays much in the development and negates pro progress made in providing multiple social infrastructure for our communities. Social infrastructure should not only be for the provision of basic services, but also the provision of public amenities like libraries, parks, recreational facilities, which are important in building our communities and providing the children and the youth with facilities to contribute to the personal development and well-being. In conclusion, Honorable House Chair and, and members, the ANC is committed in rooting out corruption and restoring the good corporate governance in local government. Through the district development model and other sub support initiative, local government can only succeed through cooperation of all government entities, private sector, political parties, civil society, traditional authorities, and the people at the regional level working together to, to transform the communities through local economic development and the provision of all basic services. Without a proper fun functional local government, the vision of the AC to create a better life for all will not be attained. Working together, mm -hmm can create a better life for all. Lastly, Chair, as I conclude, uh, I would like to quote the former chairperson of the ANCU CLIC in the province, the former NEC member of the ANCU CLIC, uh, who happens to be the chief people of the council, Ndade Seiso Joel Mohai, in, the, in his uh, closing remarks in the caucus of the ANC today, he says, and I quote that, what counts in the minds of our people is not the glory of the past, but what, what we do today to change the harsh and reality of the conditions of our people. Thank you very much, Honorable House Chair. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 Order. The next the speaker. <laughs> Order members, the next speaker is the Deputy Minister of Cocta, Honorable Dow. Honorable DM. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, House Chairperson, Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, the Honorable Deputy Chairperson of the House Chief Whip of the NCOP, Honorable Members, MECs, and the Special Delegates, um, all protocol observers. Indeed, this uh, provincial week organized by the NCOP, together with its preceding local government week, held in September this year, provides an important platform for getting to grips with the comp complex challenges 
confronting local government in our country. During this provincial week, we again drew attention and reflected upon section 139 of the constitution and the implementation thereof as we seek to enhance the performance of our local government systems. I've listened attentively to the inputs and submissions by honorable members and the debates that have been ensuing over the week and indeed in the local government week. And there are a number of issues that I believe do require our collective attention, both as government and as parliament, but indeed with the provincial governments together with local government. Therefore, it is a collective effort to improve the performance of our local government system. As indicated by the Honorable Totovu Chairperson of the Select Committee, all spheres of government must work together to extricate local government from the quagmire that it confronts. And we need to ensure that we address the systemic and structural issues that our local authorities face in the country. Amongst these, as has been reflected by honorable members, are the challenges imposed by, for example, the merger of municipalities and the creation of larger mm -hmm. municipalities in certain instances, mm -hmm. merging municipalities that necessarily are dysfunctional and in this uh, and bringing this together and finding that the result exacerbates the problem rather than resolves the problem. We're also in a situation as reflected by some of the honorable members where the fiscal framework that guides our local government system does require review. In this regard, the Finance and Fiscal Commission has made a number of recommendations that we're currently considering with regards to how we can review the system of financing local government. This includes looking at both the vertical and horizontal share of revenue that is allocated to local government enhanced and enhancing the capacity of local government to perform their executive obligations. We've also witnessed many instances of ineffective deployment of resources or suboptimal deployment of resources as reflected on amongst others by the Honorable Pillay in his submission. And it is something that we have to collectively improve, working together with our colleagues at National Treasury to ensure that we optimize the value that we derive from the investments that are made by local government throughout the country. Indeed, one of the critical challenges that we confront relates to the increased levels of credit by municipalities or the increased levels of creditors uh, that municipalities are exposed to including amongst others, the main utilities such as water, electricity and sanitation. And the exposure of our municipalities to the water ports and ESCOM in particular. This is a matter that is receiving attention both in terms of the interventions undertaken by provincial governments and the local authorities in negotiating settlements with ESCOM as part of the resolution of the problem. However, government has also established a political task team headed by Deputy President Mabuza, which political task team has the responsibility of addressing the overall challenges that are confronting ESCOM and more recently the water ports and addressing the impasse between municipalities and the water ports and ESCOM. And this resolution includes amongst others ensuring that we're able to promote culture of payment to municipalities by residents and improving the levels of payment within municipalities. We're all acutely aware that our communities, enterprises uh, and industry, all municipalities, including government, in fact, all municipalities in excess of 191 billion rand. And this places municipalities in a precarious position if they are unable to collect revenue and therefore deploy it. And this initiative by the deputy president, amongst others addresses that, including finding mechanism of ensuring that those departments who was, uh, excuse me, that those institutions that all local government, particularly in government uh, are able to meet their obligations. 
Furthermore, I think a specific focus has been with regards to the effectiveness of the implementation of Section 139 of the Constitution. In this regard, there are a number of things that we've placed on the table. The first is the need to have a greater understanding of the nature of challenges confronted by local governments as we respond. One of our observations has been that our responses have come in towards the end of uh, the problem rather than at the diagnostic level of the problem. In fact, National Treasury has produced a report that assesses in interventions in local government and has identified the reality that our interventions come in a bit too late. So we need to ensure that we in institutionalize early warning systems so that intervention can come in timelessly. Secondly, the focus is to ensure that our intervention doesn't come at the point at which there is a crisis, but that we focus on institutionalized support to local government in terms of section 154 of the constitution. As has been reflected on by honorable members, it is important that both provincial and national government undertake their collective responsibility and constitutional mandate to provide support to local government to exercise, exercise their executive obligations. And thus the implementation of the district development model enables us to institutionalize section 154 of the constitution through the establishment amongst others of district hubs intended to support local government directly, but also developing mechanisms where there's both political and institutional support to local government championed amongst others by the district champions that have been assigned uh, and deployed in this regard by the President of the Republic. Furthermore, suggestions have been made around how we improve and optimize on grants that are provided to local government. In this regard, we're currently in a process of reviewing the grant framework, particularly with regards to the municipal infrastructure grant and ensuring that it is both a direct and indirect grant and thus enables MISA to come in in instances where there is, there is inadequate performance in local government to enable communities to access services through direct support through the municipal infrastructure support agent and that people should not be disadvantaged because in fact, the capacity constraints are in the municipality itself. Honorable members have continued to raise other issues that require attention, including how we address uh, matters with regards to uh, corruption, malfeasance, and other uh, areas that require attention from all of us. Indeed, as we continue to do this, it is important that we, amongst others, take appropriate action through the systems that are in place against those who are responsible for malfeasance in our local government system. As we seek to support local government, it is also important that we support local government in building systems that prevent corruption so that we don't come in at the point that such has taken place and, and seek to resolve this at the end of the, of, of the issue, so to say, at the point that we speak, people have stolen money from government. Honorable Dango refers to the fact that it is important that we ensure that we have the fundamentals in place in addressing issues that impact on local government. In this regard, also acknowledging that different municipalities have different levels of capacity and that we need to adapt our interventions to be responsive to the disparate levels of capacity that are required by local government. And indeed through the district development model, Honorable Tango, we should be able to do that. And as indicated, we'll would also be able to revise the fiscal framework in addressing the challenges. As indicated by the Honorable Ville, part of our intervention seek to ensure that we promote a culture of payment in our communities. We as government have started a program of promoting and uh, a campaign of promoting, if they have started a campaign of promoting payment within our communities and by various institutions. This campaign is to be supplemented by practical action that needs to be undertaken both at national and local government level. Amongst others through the installation of metering solutions in municipalities 
that do not have adequate metering solutions. And through a national government pilot initiative, four municipalities have been identified for the installation of smart meters as a pilot to ensure that we can improve revenue collection in local government. Lastly, I would wish to say, Honorable Chairperson, that as we view intervention in local government, our emphasis has always been that we should not, as national government, usurp the role and function of provincial government in overseeing the work that's done at the local level. However, we're cognizant of the constitutional injunction that in fact section 1397 provides that in instances where provinces do not are unable to intervene time as the municipal government, that national government should undertake such intervention itself. We are currently in discussion about instances where it could be relevant for the national government to intervene so that we ensure that uh, our local government system is able to perform. I should, however, emphasize the point that it is not our intention to usurp the role of, local, of provincial governments. Um, and our approach should be that it should only be in exceptional circumstances that national government comes in and assumes the role of taking over functions that should be done by provincial governments under normal circumstances. On that note, Honorable Chairperson, let me join the Honorable Members in acknowledging the sterling work that has been done by the late uh, Kimi Makwetu as Auditor General of the Republic, and indeed acknowledge that today is indeed a sad day as the country relates to rest, Auditor General Kimi Makwetu. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, GM. Thank you very much. Malibongwe. Thank you. Indeed. Indeed, honorable members, on behalf of the leadership as an institution, we are confirming the words of the DM that uh, Today is a sad day in South Africa, as we have been laying Kimi Makwetu. We are once again saying, may his soul rest in internal peace. Mm -hmm. It was an inspiring to work with a epitome of efficiency and professionalism at its best. Mm -hmm. Without any waste of time, honorable members, let me take this opportunity to thank you, honorable uh, permanent delegates, special delegates uh, from our respective provinces, representative of Salga, deputy minister of Kogta, honorable uh, Tau, for availing yourself for this very important uh, debate when dealing with that sphere of government that is at a call phase of service delivery. That concludes the business of the day, and the house is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, House Chair. Thank you, House Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait, Jada. Thank you, John, for coming. Thank you. Bye. Ah, oh, I love you. I love you too, my baby. I'm proud of you guys to attend. Thank you, Nabi. Thank, Thank you. you. Someone have a good to hear from the face. Thank you, Faith. You make me feel to I'm serious. I'm serious. We are not to pay for nothing in Wazul Natal. Oh, thanks very much, Wazul Natal. You make me proud. Oh, Bye. Bye.